Welcome to another edition of Wake Up the Echoes presented by TireRack.com. I'm your host, Tony Simeone, and we have a very special episode this week. A special guest, Athletic Director Jack Swarbrick is back. I'm going to welcome you back to the show, Jack. Thanks for being here. It's going to be, I think, a unique show this week as we get a chance to talk about your time here in South Bend as the AD. Some special guests that are coming up a little bit later, but we have some time now uh, before Coach Shrewsbury joins us. I want to talk about your career later, but just as you join us for this show, what's been kind of going through your head here as you come down the home stretch? Um, you know, I don't, I, it's hard not to focus on being in the home stretch because everything's your last, you know, your last this or that. But with all that's going on in the industry, especially with the CFB, mm. you're so wrapped up, it's hard to even think about it. You're just trying to plow through that. And thanks for having me on again. I take this as an indication that you're giving me a second chance to get it right. Yeah, well, I, I gave both of us, I think, like an eight and a half out of ten last time. There was still some room to grow. I think our guests this week are going to really help us shine. Uh, and I think I'm going to kind of treat this really, because it's nostalgic for me, kind of like a, a Jack Swarbrick show. Uh, you're here for the whole show. You're bringing in some of your favorite guests. We're going to talk to them. It'll kind of take me back to 2016, 17, the glory days of the Jack Swarbrick show. Yeah, we used to... Uh... We used to do it in the uh, FIM space mm -hmm. and had student co-hosts. Yes, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, we had some great some great episodes. Yeah, we're gonna get a chance to hear from Micah Shrewsbury and two other special guests. We won't re reveal them quite yet, but we'll take a quick break and we'll bring in the head men's basketball coach, Micah Shrewsbury. That'd be great. All right, I feel like. I'm the luckiest guy on campus right now. I'm talking to the AD and the head men's basketball coach, Coach Shrewsbury. Thanks for joining us on your show. Uh, Jack helped me intro the show. I want to get to how you guys came to know each other and how you ended up bringing Coach Shrewsbury to Notre Dame. But I do want to pick up with a conversation we had right before we started recording, just about the end of the Syracuse game. I did not have the luxury of being in Syracuse. I was here for the fencing championships. You were talking through the final play, and you asked if he uh, was upset there wasn't a foul call. He was trying to call timeout. And I just want to hear about strategy. You were just talking about it. Late game down three, coach. You wanted to call timeout. Why do you like calling timeout in that situation? Oh, we, and we had talked because we had a couple different scenarios, right? We were down, let's say we were down five at a point. And we were huddled and we talked about it. We said to our guys, anything in transition, push the ball and be aggressive here. Mm -hmm. Right? We can take a two, we can take a three. Like, you push the ball and be aggressive. Because now under two minutes, I can call a timeout, mm -hmm. right? So I'm just watching the action. Then I'm running to find the closest official to call a timeout if I don't like it, right? Marcus got all the way to the basket and got a two, and we keep playing, mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, those are the kind of things you look at. In the free throw situation, Syracuse normally sends everybody back. Right. They had two guys up on the line. Okay. When Quadir Copeland, we were down three, they had two guys up on the line. So I'm like, if he misses this, like if they had four guys back, we were definitely calling that. But because they sent two guys up, mm -hmm. we had a chance to see if we could get something in transition. And those guys started playing. And as you watch the play, they're just kind of going on the fly. Like mm -hmm. Braden's ahead of Marcus. He kind of ghost screens him a little bit and is popping out and is open. But once everything was kind of set, that's when I went to say, no, we're going to, we're going to call a timeout here. Yeah. And then, yeah. Jack, this actually leads me to a question I had about the interview process for coaches. You've brought in numerous coaches to this university. He just, and I get to talk to him every week. It's fun to hear him talk about strategy. How much do you hear about strategy in the course of interviewing a coach? You're, you're evaluating potential prospects on, on all kinds of things, but do you ever get into some nitty gritty when you're interviewing a head coaching prospect? Generally, no. Mm-hmm. Um, I always start with what the program needs. Okay. And it's very different from program to program or hiring to hiring. Mm -hmm. People have heard me say many times what the program needed when I hired Brian Kelly was completely different from what the program needs were when I hired Coach Freeman. Right. And that's the starting point. What What are the criteria we're looking for? And we don't even discuss candidates. I don't even return the phone calls coming to me about who I should hire until we've really vetted out 
These are the criteria. And then we move from there. So with this specific situation, what were you looking for when you identified Coach Shrewsbury as a guy you wanted to take over this role at this time? Yeah, well, I was looking for a teacher mm. um, who could who could help develop our players. Um, I wanted a program that played really good defense because I thought in the ACC yeah. um, that was going to be increasingly important for us. But it was really the cultural dynamic. We were going to lose a lot of players. Mm -hmm. And while that presents Coach Shrews with an enormous challenge, it's also an opportunity to build a culture from scratch. You yeah. got, you're not inheriting a squad that's got a way they do stuff. So the cultural dynamic was really important to me. Coach, can you take me back to maybe your first interaction with Jack or the first time that this opportunity was on your radar. Just what was that experience like? What was the conversation like? And what was going through your head back then? Because I never actually heard you talk about it. Yeah, uh, it. Um, you know, for me, I'm like, I, and you've gotten to know me. Like, you know how like I, I don't think about anything that's going on, right? Like I'm like so locked in on the season and everything else. Right. But uh, you know, you're not. I'm not that oblivious to know like what's happening in our sport. You're aware. I'm aware. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and, um, you know, you see that the Notre Dame job is open is going to be open. And that's something that's, you know, it, it, it intrigues you, right. As a kid from Indiana, like that's very intriguing to me. So, um, as, as you like think about that process and you think about the possibilities, um, it's just something that, you know, it's pretty special. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I've grown up I mean, I always profess my love for Notre Dame football and how I grew up. But, That's the hook. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a great hook. Jack, is well, there – oh, go ahead. Coach really shaped the interview process because early on he said to me, I only care about two things, my family and basketball. Oh, that's pretty good. So we weren't talking presidential politics or anything. We were talking, <laughs> we were talking basketball and family, and and in fact, when Father John and I met with uh, Molly and Micah, I'd say the first forty-five minutes was family. Mm. It's been pretty neat to see this first-year culture kind of get established. Is there something you usually tell, whether it's been to Coach Shrewsbury or to other first-year coaches? Like, what's a piece of advice you give to people in their first year at Notre Dame? Oh, there's not a whole lot you can you can say or do. You just try and reinforce the fact that everybody here is available to help, hmm. that the resources are here. And anything we can do, we're available, but otherwise we're going to stay out of your way, right? We're not – this is not a program where um, I or anybody else around here is inclined to say, well, why did we run this play? You know, it's just it's not how it works here. Uh, we hire great coaches who can build great programs and teach student athletes and as a result win a lot of games. And That's what's happening with our basketball program right now. Coach, in the end of the process, when you made the decision to ultimately take the job here, what was it about maybe the conversations with Jack or just being around the campus more, getting a chance to, to see what this would be like that kind of made it go through your head like this was the place to be? I think um... – you know, you start looking at a lot of different things. You look at fits, mm -hmm. right? I, I thought the, 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 obviously the profile of the school mm -hmm. um, and the basketball program and the conference, like the kids that we would be able to attract here fits with the kids that I've coached in the past or mm -hmm. tried to recruit in the past. So, you know, you see that as a fit. And um, like Jack talked about, family is really important to me. Um, like, you know, my family is a huge part of every decision that, that I make, but you could see the family atmosphere that's here. Yeah. Right. And, um, just being able to, since I've been here, the interaction with the other coaches, um, just, or that's through texts or emails or face, FaceTime with each other, um, supporting each other in different ways. Like there is such a family environment to this place to this athletic department that just has a different feel to it. And that that's important to me. Um, it's really important. I think you said a couple episodes ago that 
the bond you guys have with the women's staff in particular is really unique in your coaching experience. Jack, you've been here for a while now. You're obviously very familiar with the university. What is it about the athletic department as a whole that's allowed the coaching staffs to, I think, not just in hoops, but across the board, kind of bend each other's ear and really rely on each other? And, and it, what, I, what sounds like in talking to coaches, it's, it's unique to Notre Dame in that way. I, I think it's derivative of the university itself. I mean, that's, that's how this place operates. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a vice president of the university who's on the president's leadership council. It's where you, you're not separated out. Right. Our student athletes are integrated into the campus life in a way that's really unique. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, it, that infiltrates every part of the program. Now we try and create an environment where people reinforce that, you know, that they do reach out to each other and text and FaceTime or, or attend each other's events. Yeah. Um, one of the things I always stress, especially with our assistant coaches is go to other teams practices. Mm. As an assistant coach, you will learn so much by watching how another coach conducts practices and uh, that all of that helps develop a relationship. Yeah. It's neat to see the coaches at, at the other events. We talk a lot, or I've heard you talk a lot about the importance when you took this job to have football competing for national championships again. There's a video that runs before every basketball game. I'm not sure if it's when you're on the floor yet or not, Coach. We've talked about when you come on the floor. Uh, but Coach Shrewsbury in his introductory press conference talks about competing for and winning national championships here. I want to kind of hear from both of you on that perspective of the, the importance of that. But starting with you, Jack, just how important was it for you to get a coach in place here who can take this team to the level where they are competing for national championships? Um, it, it, it doesn't really have anything to do with basketball. It's again about the university. We pursue excellence, hmm. excellence in our dorms and our laboratories and the administrators and faculty we attract. So we're, we're trying to win national championships. I always say all, all the time, it is great to win conference championships. But if that's our only goal, that's all you're going to get. Hmm. We want to win national championships. And and so as you're evaluating potential hires, one of the things you're asking yourself is, can I see that happening with this coach? Can I see this coach taking the program to that level? Yeah. Um, it's not a guarantee. It's not, oh, yeah, we're going to win. They are really hard to win. Really hard to win. <laughs> um you know, there are a lot of coaches that get there, get close a lot of times and never, never win it. Um, that's okay. It's being in the mix. Hmm. It's being a team that everyone can see has the potential to be a national champion. Coach, for you, when you came here, why did you think that could happen here? And, and you know, you say it with such conviction in that video. Why do you believe that? I think, one, it, it starts with, um, it starts with the vision, right? Like, I need to have it. Our staff needs to have it. Our players need to have it, but it needs to come from above us as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and um, Jack talked about pursuing excellence. Like everybody's doing it. Everybody's trying to pursue excellence here in all areas. So like there's a standard for that, that that's been set. And now like what do, what else does this place have that helps us, like I talked about the the kids that we can recruit, right? The culture that we can build right now, like, you know, we're able to hire the best coaches to help us, you know, develop and grow all of that. Like there's a lot that goes into winning a championship. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you got to, you got to have the right things in place. You got to have some luck, mm -hmm. right? All these things have to happen, but, like having the right things in place and having the right vision is really important. Mm -hmm. And I thought we had that here. Right. And, and that, and I know the kind of kids that we can attract. I know the kind of culture that we can build here. Um, you know, it, it that's why it, it, you know, I say it, um, cause I want our guys to dream big. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen it, right. Like I've been there on the final day twice and, you know, we did it from the horizon league, the mid major league. Yeah. And basketball is getting tougher and tougher each year, but um, you know, to to do it at a place like this would be special. Last question I have is is for you, Jack. Just now that you're 
going to be transitioning out? What excites you about watching Notre Dame men's basketball once you move on from the role you're in right now? It, it may be among the most compelling examples of building a culture that I've seen in my 16 years. Hmm. We talked a lot about culture during the interviewing process, and um, I could tell Mike understood it and knew its importance. But to watch him build it here this year and uh, to see it manifest itself, right? It, 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 it doesn't begin with on-court performance. The on-court performance is a consequence of having the culture. And, um, boy, when I've gone over to practice, and you know, first of all, I feel like I, I thought I knew basketball. I realize I don't now. <laughs> um, but, but you see the cultural elements developing, right? And then you see them over the course of the season build and build and build. And uh, that's what excites me most, right? I mean, the winning is going to come here. Yeah. Um, with the, you know, as, as Mike continues to attract the kids, he, he envisions as part of this program. But they'll be coming into the culture that's already built. And they'll understand when they get here, all right, this is what I have to be part of. That's what will drive it. Yeah. It's, it's your point. Uh, being around practice or trying to talk X's and O's with Coach Shrews, it can be a little bit of a humbling experience oh sometimes. God. I start, <laughs> hey, let's talk this strategy in about 30 seconds, and I regret it because I've exposed myself as not having thought about it about a tenth as much as he has. Yeah, I thought practice was being inducted in a different language. <laughs> I mean, it was it, it, it was educational and amazing. But uh, one, one final thing about Coach that uh, – and we talked about how great his focus is on basketball and family, the two things. And I think it was after the second game, I went and visited him. I said, okay, of the stuff around the game, what would you like to do differently, right? Because we sort of did what we did before, you know, whether it's how you take the court or, or something else. And he said, I don't know anything about that stuff. I didn't pay any attention to that. I got a basketball game. <laughs> I said, all right. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Oblivious. It's good. It's, you want to be oblivious because you're so locked in on hoops. Very oblivious, yes. Coach, thanks for stopping by. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. Thanks, Coach. Thank all right. We're back here on Wake Up the Echoes. We have head volleyball coach, Selima Rockwell. Jack, it feels like a Jack Swarbrick show. We used to always bring on a coach. I have sources all over this campus, and I've been told there's a great story about the process that took place to get Coach Rockwell to assume this role as the head coach. I'll let you start if you want to lay out the story about how you guys got into contact and began that process. Well, I'll let her tell the final chapter, uh, which we've told a few times, and it <laughs> definitely is interesting. But um, there was a real familiarity the coaching process with the, the hiring, recruiting process with Salima because it reminded me of my dating life. She said no about eight times. <laughs> Um, we, we, we'd ask, she'd say, no, we'd bring in some other candidates. I'd say to Missy, you're kidding me. Come on. You know, <laughs> we, we, we can do better. And she'd say, well, you know, that's Salima. I said, okay, let's go back to Salima. And, uh, she was really good at turning me down. What, what? Okay. Now time to explain yourself. What, what were all these no's to Notre Dame coming from? Okay. They weren't straight up no's. I mean, they were, well, maybe they were kind yeah. of. So this this story reminds me of actually my my story with my husband. And when he tells it, it's a totally different perspective than when I tell it, <laughs> when it started, how it developed. Um, but but really, it was, um, you know, I, I'd gotten out of coaching for a couple of years and I was in broadcasting and and calling volleyball and doing the national championships. So when this this all surfaced, I was really knee deep in um the regionals and and heading into the NCAA Final Four, so the preparation of that is I prepare like I'm coaching a match, right? I'm coaching two matches, right? I'm scouting both teams. I'm I'm in it. So you know, Missy calls me and and I get the first call and I'm like, you know, like no, I'm I'm doing this. Like this is my life. This is where I'm at right now. So there was a first hard no because uh, I was like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm, this is who I am now. Um, but it did as as it evolved over time and Missy was relentless and kind of kept coming back and saying, we just want you to take a look and really 
think about this. And, you know, I had my circle of friends, my little circle of trust. And I'm like, hey, guys, this is one of those programs that, you know, as a volleyball coach, you you talk about where what are the sleeper schools? What are the programs that would be a really good move? Like yeah. if they ever called. And Notre Dame was always one that was kind of in the back of my mind, just based on the school, the location, the name. There's so much surrounding Notre Dame that that makes it prime to be an amazing uh, program. It, it had been in the past. Right. So, so I just kept considering it more and more and thinking, if I do want to get back into it, what's that going to look like? Because I'm not just taking any job. And it became... It became about the people, everyone that I met, everyone that I talked to. Um, they flew me out to the bowl game because um, we weren't able to connect ahead of time. And I was able to meet everyone. And it was clear that this, everything about Notre Dame aligned with everything that I've ever been looking for to be, become a head coach. Coach, I, I or uh, Jack, I actually heard Coach say something I've heard a lot of coaches on this campus talk about it was just we need to get them on campus and sometimes it's to see the campus but I think it's to have them be around the people is that something you've seen in your 16 years here that I've talked to this person on the phone if I can just get them to be in this environment it'll all click for them yeah very much so I, I think recruiting is a similar way you know you feel you feel you got a decent chance when you get the prospective student athlete on campus and mm -hmm. expose them to a lot of different people we we sort of um took full advantage of it in this one though the last person she visited with was marcus oh, yeah. we, uh, we we called the closer <laughs> we closed with our best closing <laughs> so i was i felt good about it yeah i i spend a lot of time with coach freeman here and then also chad his recruiting you know right hand man i understood immediately why, why it's so easy to commit to notre dame when, when talking to those guys so when you ultimately made the choice here what about those maybe first few months excited you about the opportunity of being the head coach at Notre Dame and getting a chance to do what you just laid out, which is take this program to where I think a lot of people believe it can be and hope it is? Well, the first couple of months were exciting for sure, challenging <laughs> as well. Um, you know, in the, in the interim between coaches, a lot of players had to figure out what they were doing, sure. right? So we, we lost a lot of players along the way. It was very thin. I think I had six people in the gym um, tough to practice that way. Tough to practice. Um, but, you know, you, you talk about a long-term play and, and where where you're headed with the program. So quickly you have to assess where are we and what is the culture you want to build? What does that look like in the gym with whomever you have? It doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. You know, it was my job to go out, recruit the right players, the right talent, um, and and it takes time. It takes time to to build a sustainable model as well. And that's kind of where where I am and where, you know, I think I was fortunate. The administration, they understood. They understood what I was walking into. And, you know, that doesn't happen all the time. Mm. You know, you expect immediate results or unrealistic expectations right away. But really, what is the goal? And so for me, the excitement of just being on campus learning about everything that Notre Dame had to offer and and how was I going to put forward what I knew about about the program to my recruits I may not have been engaged in the most fulsome disclosure I've ever engaged in in recruiting coaches uh, we we were selective a little bit you were what, what was not disclosed we get that on the table I mean you're, you're on your way out we can talk yeah, about throw it, it out there what do you, what do you space? got <laughs> Knowing that the roster might be a little thin and only six people, there's a little mm -hmm. gap there. <laughs> um, we can spend a lot of time talking about uh, the challenges of getting transfers in, for example. Uh, so, uh, mm -hmm. Colin Refrain. We, we, were, uh, we stressed the positives. I had a, a note here for uh, me to ask each of you what surprised you about each other, getting to work with each other in the first year or two. I think I, I now know that for uh, Coach Rockwell, the surprises were things you left untold to her, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some of the... But she never flinched <laughs> and uh, never came into my office and said, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> She's she, her, her positivity is infectious. What's been something about having her on campus, seeing her now operate? Because if you're courting someone or you're trying to get them to take a job, you don't really get to know them until you see them in action every day. What's been your impression of Coach Rockwell? What's something that's maybe surprised you about seeing her 
operate on campus so far. I don't think any surprised us. It sort of reaffirms, hmm. you know, the choice you're making. But her energy and optimism is infectious. And uh, her the passion she's developed for this place. If anything, I worry about it's how much we lean on her. Um, we're always having her interview people or, you know, in, engaged in helping other sports recruit or I, we just put her on a committee that's going to eat a bunch of time. We, uh, we're, we, we have to be careful because, uh, people respond so positively to her and want to work with her that we've, we got to protect her time to be a great volleyball coach. Coach, I want to talk volleyball just really quick with you. You're, First of all, so we got to mention that Coach Shrewsbury worked at Penn State. You worked at Penn State and played at Penn State. So something's going on with the, the Penn State pipeline here right now. But I think I've got you. I'm not I, welcome there. I don't think you're welcome in, in, inside <laughs> no. the, the state lines. Uh, I went to Pepperdine. So there's okay. great volleyball mm -hmm. history there on both the men's and women's side. That was the first time I got exposed to volleyball there. And when I got there, I look at the rankings every week when I'm in Malibu and I see Penn State, Penn State yeah. at the top of men's and women's. Yeah. You obviously know what it takes to get a program or see a program get to the top of the sport. What about your experience as a player and coach are you bringing to Notre Dame that thinks you can take this program to the top of the sport? Right. I mean, I think it, it does take time hmm. to get a program in a place that it, the expectation, the standards, the level that you play is just what you do, right? Okay. You, We can drive it from the outside and – hey, this is how we're establishing the culture and the effort in the gym and the work ethic. But suddenly it morphs into it comes from it's an internal drive. The team drives it. Okay. And what I've seen from my experience as a player in the Final Four and winning national championships, it has to come from the players. So once you get it to the point where they are not letting each other off the hook, they're holding one another accountable, themselves accountable, and that's the culture that it that just exists in the program. That's when you know you can take it to the next the next level. So for me, I just I want to give it to them. I want to bring that that fire, that relentless pursuit of excellence, um, and and help them raise the standards for themselves and do things they didn't think they could actually achieve on their own. Mm. And it's the most rewarding thing to watch a student athlete blossom from their freshman year to their senior year and they come in unsure and they leave just a rock star ready to take on the world. <laughs> it's freaking amazing. And that, that is what does it. When you lay it out like that, I can see why you would jump back into the coaching ranks because the, the top end success is just so exciting to see coach. Or I, I keep calling you coach. You kind of, you got a coach in your own way. Not even a little <laughs> bit, but okay. <laughs> The last one I have before we take a break is just about, it's it's similar to Coach Shrews, right? You bring in Coach Rockwell towards the end of your tenure here. What excites you about the future of the volleyball program and getting to watch her continue to build this program after you leave? Well, um, I thought for a long time that it was the single most underdeveloped program here. I mean, Notre Dame ought to be really good in volleyball. Yeah, it's good. Really thing. good. Given the region that we're in in terms of talent, uh, the schools that are really good around us that we can compete against. Um, you know, Catholic schools historically have produced a lot of good volleyball players, Catholic high schools. So I just thought everything was here. I mean, we have investments we need to make in the program to support it and get it there. But, but I thought the basic question, you know, there's some sports you look at here and think really tough to win, you know, because of weather or some some other issue, but we ought to be really good in volleyball. So that's one of the reasons we were aiming so high in the coaching search was because of the potential that I believe volleyball has here. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to prove that in the years ahead with this coach. Yeah. Um, Cause she's, she's extraordinarily talented, has everything possible. And I, I've got to say, I couldn't agree more with her uh, her reference to accountability. Mm. That that tends to be the difference. Um, I, I've given a speech to a number of our teams this year about what I've learned from the 11 championships I've been part of while I've been here, and I take the ingredients of each and talk about what makes them. And in that, I talk about accountability. 
generationally, that's hard to sort of develop now. I mean, if most of the tough messages you've delivered in your life to college, to to peers is through a text message, you're not going to be you're not going to be ready to look at your teammate and say, "Hey, that wasn't good enough." Mm. Um, and I've been around great teams. I, I use the example all the time of Bate Manning stopping in practice to do a whole session over again because it didn't meet the standard, right? Um, all of our teams that succeed here, that's sort of the the last piece of the puzzle. They've got the talent. They've got great coaching. But does the coach have to tell you you have to do something else or give more? Or does somebody else on the team tell them? Yeah. Well, I, I look forward to seeing the team grow. I want to get you back on this show so we can talk six one or six two five one. So yes. you so you got me, you got me okay. nervous <laughs> talking to a legend like you. Six two five one. I know we can talk and, and all, all the different stuff. But thanks for coming on. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be back with more. Thanks. Thank you. All right, we're back on Wake Up the Echoes. Jack, we have a very special guest. Manti Teo has joined us. Manti, thanks for joining us. You're in Utah. We're going to talk about your snowboarding uh, adventures in a little bit, but I want to start with what you were doing before we started recording, which was you were referring to Jack here as Uncle Jack. Explain to me why you call Jack Uncle Jack. So in, in the Polynesian culture, um, there, are, there are individuals who we consider family that we aren't biologically related to. Um, we We understand that family isn't just made of of blood relation, it is also, you know, made of of individuals who we know and that we love and that we admire. And Uncle Jack is one of those one of those individuals for me, for my siblings, for my parents, and and now for my children and, and for my wife. And so that's why I always refer to Uncle Jack as that. You know, he's somebody who whenever he calls, I, I always answer whenever he needs anything. I always do my best to come come through. And so, um, he's somebody who who has gained that that title in in my family and he's somebody that will forever hold that title and, and that admiration and that love you know for me and my family so i'm I'm very grateful that we we have another wise individual in our families you know, at uncle jack what does it mean when you hear that jack oh um you know i could i could make a strong case it's the it's the highest honor i've received here hmm. um you know it's and Manti described it so accurately. It's not just that he and I have a very special relationship and much as he thinks of me as a family member, I think of him the same way. Um, but his parents have always treated me that way, mm. right? And that's that's one of the really unique elements of it, right? That, that the, as, as our relationship has developed, I very much feel part of the family and honored to be part of the family. When I go to Notre Dame, my parents and all my siblings always say, tell Uncle Jack to say hello. Like that's, he's one of those, those individuals um, that, that they make sure that they say, Hey, t tell Uncle Jack that we said hello. And so it, you know, Uncle Jack is right with, it's, it's my entire family. You know, you'll never run into a tell that they don't, you know, acknowledge Uncle Jack as uncle. So it's, 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 it's definitely a, a family wide, you know, acknowledgement for sure. And and the la at the last game, Manti's parents presented me with a special lay um, that was, I may get it wrong, Manti, but some version of the lay worn by a chief. Really? Um, and that that's stayed in my office till it absolutely degraded <laughs> into dust. <laughs> um, it was an incredible honor. Manti, can you take me back to the first time you remember meeting Jack and just what was your impression? Obviously you guys have experienced a lot together and the relationships developed over the years, more than a decade now, but what was that first interaction like when you met Jack and he was the AD at Notre Dame? Well, that, it, it was exactly that. I, I knew uncle Jack as athletic director. Um, I didn't know his history, um, but as I continued to know him and, and we continued to build that relationship, um, I started to see that he was trying to do the same thing that I was trying to do. Or a matter of fact, I was trying to do the same thing that he was trying to do. He was trying to raise the standard of, of, of excellence at the University of Notre Dame. And, and for me to be one of those torch bearers, you know, sort of say, I, I, I kind of took that upon myself as, okay, Uncle Jack's trying to do this thing. 
um, I'm I'm all in, you know, with, with him. But it definitely started off like I knew Uncle Jack as athletic director. I remember there there are a few times when my parents would come in and we would go into Uncle Jack's office and they would they would talk to Uncle Jack and. I know that Uncle Jack didn't, you know, do that often. And so I was really, really grateful for those times and those opportunities that, you know, my family got to meet Uncle Jack. Um, but our our relationship really started to um, take form later in my career as, you know, things started to, to, to pick up a little. And we, uh, we started to really close the gap between where we were and where we wanted to be. And, you know, what, any way that I could be an ambassador, I was always... Somebody since I was little, I was always kind of trying to do my best to represent the people who I love the most. And it just was perfect for me because if I was a great rep um, representative of the school, that means I represented Uncle Jack well. And so I wanted to make sure that those people that saw me doing so would go back to the people who I love and say, hey, listen, like he represented you well. And so whenever our Uncle Jack would tell me those things, it really meant a lot to me. Whenever my parents said those things to me, it really meant a lot to me. So it gave me actual motivation to really, you know, hold that standard, you know, to, to where it should be. My first um, memories or knowledge of Manti, we actually didn't meet, but the, uh, the, the first one was his recruiting visit and everybody was very focused on it that we, you know, number one recruit in the country and uh he comes in and it's Syracuse game and 13 inches of snow and <laughs> got shorts on and no jacket <laughs> and uh we lose to arguably the worst football team in the country at the time they had fired their coach and <laughs> they were on their third quarterback and the students started throwing snowballs yeah. and and I just resigned myself to the fact that this was the last time I'd ever seen Manti other than on television. <laughs> there was there was no no chance he was coming. So that was my first impression. The second was when he surprised us on National Signing Day and he called and said, I'm coming to Notre Dame. And, you know, the celebration inside the Goog was enormous. And, of course, we go, Charlie goes before the media and it's set for, for noon. And uh, noon comes, and we still don't have his letter of intent. <laughs> One comes, and we still don't have his letter of intent. And so now, of course, we all start to panic, panic, <laughs> believe, you know, something's happened between the the phone call and now. And we're wondering, you know, oh, my God, we, we've lost him. And so we finally call the school, and we get a woman at the school, an administrator there, and we ask if, you know, she can help us understand if she'll be faxing Manti's letter of intent. She said, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it. Do you know how many <laughs> student athletes at this school signed letter of intents today? We said, yeah, but one of them is a lot more important than the other. <laughs> Could you move that to the top of the page, please? And she sent it to us. So relieved the little tension. So those are my first, my first two impressions. But as soon as he got on campus you could tell this was a different student athlete. Um, he was he was so inquisitive about the place and trying to understand it, but his leadership just stood out initially. It was impossible not to get to know him um, because he wanted to have those relationships. The, there's a small number of, of student athletes who want to know who the athletic director is mm -hmm. and a larger number who aren't inclined that way. Sure. Manti wanted to know who the athletic director was. He wanted to understand how all this worked, and you could tell that immediately. Why did you want to know that? Why were you so curious about who the athletic director was and, and what was really going on, I guess, under the hood at Notre Dame when you got here, Manti? Well, I'm a, you know, it goes back to my beliefs of family. You know, in order for me to be a, a, a successful in, in what we were trying to do, I had to understand what the family dynamic was like and who the head of that family was, because you can always tell the direction that everything is going by who the head is, who's the leader. And so Uncle Jack being the leader of the entire um, athletic side and, 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 and all the various things that he did, me being a leader in my space at Notre Dame in the football world, which is one of the, the, the bigger sports in all of the country, I wanted to be able to understand and align what I was trying to do with the leader. And so I... I got to know Uncle Jack, but I also got to know, you know, the chefs and the janitors and, 
you know, the, 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 the people that would clean up the Goog and the indoor facility, you know, so it was, it was just meeting everybody that I needed to meet um, in order to, you know, find my place, you know, and understand what this, this, this place is all about, not just from, you know, an athletic standpoint, but what's this brand, what do we stand for, you know, and, and, you know, it, I didn't have to go far after meeting Uncle Jack to know exactly what we stood for. Um, our values and you know what our goals were and you know it aligned perfectly with, with my goals and my values and so that's why with Uncle Jack it's just it was easy for me to just jump on board and say okay let's do this let's take this as far as we can take it I was not here in 2012 but I, I want to ask both of you kind of the same question and, and Manti I'll start with you and then I want to hear you you chime in as well Jack but I talked to a lot of people that were here in 2012 and they talk about the buzz on this campus just feeling different than really at any other time in recent memory. Can you go back to 2012 and just tell me what it felt like? Obviously, Manti, you were a huge part of that. I nearly won the Heisman that year. Just what was the experience like being in the moment, game after game? I was in Arizona for what it's worth, you know, and, and I was following it very closely, not having a care in the world about Notre Dame. So I can only imagine what it was like to be in the midst of it all in South Bend. It's now been over 10 years, but what does it feel like when you think back to those moments that come to mind? I, I, I when I speak to people, I, I, I tell them it was the summit, man. You know, it was, there was nothing higher. There was nothing greater, you know, than that, than that season, that feeling. Um, I would run into different individuals who were able to experience that feeling. And there was a spirit about it. And it's, it's beautiful when you talk about, you bring up that word spirit because Notre Dame is a very spiritual place. And to add more spirituality to that place from a football standpoint, it was, it was a perfect marriage, you know, between the spirit of Notre Dame, the values which, which our institution holds, but then you're able to complement that with the success of the football team. Probably one of the biggest brands uh, for Notre Dame is the football team. And for us to do, what we were able to do in 2012 um granted there, there were some games that i swear like i have i have way more white hairs you know than 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 i should at 33 years old because of those games and they were just some of the closest games but that added to that feeling you know i think if we were to blow teams out yeah i would have less gray hairs but there was there was a synergy that occurred and there was a camaraderie and a bond that occurred with the, the team and the student athletes with the team and the Notre Dame network that wouldn't have happened if we didn't do two goal line stands, one against Stanford and one against USC. It wouldn't have happened if we wouldn't have won three overtimes against Pitt. You know, those, those things don't happen if, if, if certain experiences and circumstances don't, don't occur. And I, I, I wish that I could go back to those times just to experience that feeling after winning a game in the stadium and walking out of those gates and just walking around campus and just the electricity, you know, it, 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 it was something that can't be described. And honestly, there's no duplicating that, you know, to, to be at Notre Dame, to do that at Notre Dame now, I wish I could say we, I, I could hold up a ring and say, I'm a 2013 national champion. You know, I, I wish I could do that, mm -hmm. but I can only imagine what it would look like had we done that. You know what I'm saying? Uncle Jack, like that's, you go up, your, your name is etched forever up there, you know? And so it's, it's, it was such a, a beautiful place to be in at that time. It's such a special bond, special moments, and you literally feel like you could do anything and everything, and the responsibility that gives you um, to really do and take that thing and, and do right by the people that are that are closest to you. So it was, it was, it was, it is undescribable. So even it, as I describe, it, I still ain't describing it the best. You know, it was just, it was just amazing. Yeah, I had, I had never experienced anything like it. But I'd also make the argument, I'm not sure anybody or any other place has either. Hmm. Because part of what created that feeling was the fact that our student athletes are part of the university. So the, the students very much felt 
their fellow students were achieving this, right? That, that they were together in it in a, in a way that doesn't happen in a lot of places where they're separated. I mean, I won't use his name, but a very famous quarterback said after winning the national championship, he was going over the stands to meet some fellow students because he had never met any in his time at the school. Mm -hmm. um, ours, our, our situation is just different. And so th there was this notion of being in it together. Everybody mm -hmm. we're just watching the football team. We were all part of it, and that creates such a special environment. And I'm glad Manti brought it up. If, if you ask me, okay, you get one picture you can put on your wall of your time here. It's the Stanford goal line stand. Mm. I mean, it was like a movie set. It was, it was <laughs> foggy and rainy. Stanford's my other alma mater. Everything mm. about it just it was such a special moment and uh, led by our best football player. Last question I've got, Manti, um, and you've kind of hit on it really in your, your response there, but I, I would just love to hear you because I, I can tell you you're very proud of having gone to Notre Dame and contributed to the university and, and you know take a lot of pride in, in what the university stand, stands for. Just what does it mean when you think of Notre Dame? What's the impact it's had on your life? And as you go forward, you build a family. When you think about Notre Dame, what comes to mind? A lot of things come to mind. Um Notre Dame is, is, that's my home. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a place where every time I go there, there are two places where I go, where I feel like I'm at home. One is when I go home to Hawaii and I'm in the Pacific ocean and I'm swimming and I, I feel like I'm in my mom's room again. Like that's, that's one place. The other place is when I, when I land in South Bend and I'm walking around that campus and I, and although it looks a, a little different than it used to when I was there, it's a feeling that again, like I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be, you know. And so Notre Dame will always, always be home to me. Um, now, what, what has Notre Dame done for me? There's nothing. Notre Dame has done everything for me and and more. Um, I've Uncle Jack knows this as of late. I've, I've got into private equity, and it's a it's a space where <laughs> the top of the top is filled with Notre Dame alum. And it's funny, somebody asked me just this past weekend, hey, what do you take of, I think it's Stephen A., I think his name, that's him. What did you think of his yeah. comments about Notre Dame? And I was like, well, I, do, I, I don't even listen to what he said, so tell me what he said. And then they told me what he said, like how Notre Dame, they're always talking about Notre Dame this time. And I said, you know what? As a Notre Dame alum and as somebody who loves my school, thank you. Because you just pointed out that even we haven't even won a national championship in my lifetime, and we're still talked about more than those that won back-to-back -back national championships. Like, we are a brand that you can't stop talking about. That just, you probably gave us the best recruiting pitch, uh, pitch that anybody could give the University of Notre Dame. And so, you know, I, I told that person, I was like, that just goes to show who we are. Now just imagine what happens when we do win that national championship, what happens, you know? So... Notre Dame has done so much for me. It's done so much for my family. But, you know, specifically, since we are on this call, um, that that man, Uncle Jack, has done a lot for me um, personally. And um, I said this in, in the first Ask, um, Ask Jack that I was uh, part of, and that was when the story broke about the catfishing incident that I was that 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 I was a part of in 2013. Everybody was in turmoil. Everybody didn't know what to do. And everybody just wanted to be quiet. And, you know, a lot of people were. Except for Uncle Jack. Uncle Jack was one of the very, very few that stood up and came to my defense in a time where it wasn't so popular to do so. Yeah. And so if there's anything to anybody about what that school means to me and what that man means to me, that is an indication of, of who he is. When the world was... And we, we talked about it a little bit in 2012. It was it was such a, a, a it was a dreamy place to be. There was everybody chanting your name, you know, wearing your jerseys, saying a lot of great things about you. But in 2013, for me personally, that that changed. You know, everything became negative. Every everything became hateful. Everything, you know, there were a lot of critics back then. There were a lot of memes and jokes back then. But that man sitting next to you stood next to me, you know, in a time where 
it felt like the whole world was against me. Mm-hmm. And as I started to experience the Notre Dame community and the Notre Dame family always stood by me. And so that, for me, if there's anybody that needs to know anything about that school, is this. When the world turned their back on me, Notre Dame stood right next to me. And that should tell you everything you need to know about ND and my and my love and my 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 admiration and my connection to that school. Well, and it it it, it carries um, with the central theme of this conversation. Um, as I thought about what I would do, um, the question I asked myself is, what would I want someone in my position to do for my son? Uh, in this circumstance, and it, my actions became easy, right? Because I thought of Manti as a son. I thought of it that way, and and okay, I'm I'd expect the I'd expect the university to defend my son, um, and and some someone said to me more than one person along the line, it was stupid of you to take that risk. I said there was no risk. I know this man i i don't there's no risk involved to me i know i know him i know everything about him and i know he's a victim here and so yeah that was easy and i want to close with a family question how are the kids well it's just we experienced the, the, our, our first trip around my two-year-old turned the wi-fi button off you know and so we were, we thought we had everything baby proofed and child proofed in this house but me and my wife just started to realize that my, my two-year-old knows how to turn doorknobs now. And so she's getting, and it, the thing that that's a little, a little challenging with that one is she understands that the toilet is not a place to play in, but my <laughs> one-year-old doesn't understand that. And so she usually takes him with her and opens up the bathroom thing and then she'll start to play. But then my son would be in the, I was like, okay, we have to put, we have to child proof everything in this house. <laughs> uh, but they 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 are growing and and it is such um it is such a blessing to be their father um and and i i think i'm it's safe to say this on this platform because we are notre dame and we all we, we we are christian and we understand where everything comes from the most beautiful thing about being a father is that for the first time that i get to see how god sees me as his son and it gives a lot of context to my responsibility as a father of my children um, to try and mold them as, as best as I can um, to make sure that they know how much that I love them, how much how proud I am of them, and that, that God loves them even more. And it, it's such a beautiful connection that I have with my, with my children, and they're, they're the I, and Uncle Jack can tell you, I won a lot, of, a lot, I won a lot of trophies, won a lot, of, won a lot of, uh, um, a lot of prizes. But the best, best award and best trophy that I could ever get was my children. They are the most beautiful things in my life, and 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 obviously, I'm constantly recruiting them to go to Notre Dame. So yeah, we have. I just yeah. I was I think we have. We have two NILs. Uh, <laughs> not your letters have been tense, sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah. we have an NIL situation, we have, we, too. we have two national letters that's <laughs> waiting. So yeah. uh, just, just uh, we're, yeah. we're tracking them. I was talking to Coach Freeman when I was there um, for the last game, for Uncle Jack's last game. And my son and I, and that's my my son's first time in, to, to Notre Dame. He just turned one on January 16th. And so I'm over there, and he's what? He's nine, ten months old. 10 months old, I think at that time. And I walk up to coach Freeman and coach Freeman was like, he's a big boy. I was like, yeah, he's a big boy. I'm trying to recruit him already. And coach Freeman walks up over to him and he looks at my son. He's like, you officially have a a full ride scholarship to the university of Notre Dame. And so I called my wife. I was like, Hey babe, um, Cairo just got his first verbal. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see him in, in 2041. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's it, I, you know, I can only, I can only, I can only wish. And obviously, everything that we do here at Notre Dame is uh, here at home is is Notre Dame. It's it's everywhere. So, yeah, I can't wait for those days. Have you become a skier? No, oh, Uncle Jack, I'm a snowboarder. Uh oh, okay. The difference because I was at one of those um, was at a family office retreat 
in in Deer Valley, and I guess Deer Valley doesn't like my kind over there. They don't like snowboarders, so you can only be you can you can only ski on those slopes. I was like, ah, but yeah, I, I blew out my knee at Deer Valley. See, I, I'm gonna have to go talk to him then, Uncle Jack. I'm gonna go talk to him for you. Where were you? It was not, it was not their fault. <laughs> Operator Air. Where were you? What 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 resort were you at? Oh, um, we were actually staying down in Salt Lake City, and we just went, went up, up to ski for the day, and uh, it was all the way at the top, very top of the mountain. Okay. Three person chair lift. Went to get off the chair, and the person next to me put their ski on top of mine. Oh, oh no! And when I went to push off, I couldn't. Right? Yeah. Locked. So I knew immediately and just crumpled to the ground. The consequence, however, was that for the half hour that they were getting me on the litter to ski me down the mountain, yeah, no lift could move because I was right, oh, right on the, the bottom, to the top. Yeah, so I'm skiing down. Everyone's pointing at me, <laughs> yelling at me. They're furious because they were trapped in, in the chair for a half hour. Oh my gosh! Oh whoa. I'll bet there are a lot of uh, other snowboarders on the mountain whose greatest fear is that you might collide. <laughs> you know what? You know what, Uncle Jack? There has been like, there has been some little kids who have just like cut me off, and I don't know whether it's because I took jujitsu or something. But had I not fallen the way that I did, I probably would have broke something. And so I had a buddy that same that same day who was you know making fun of me because he was right right behind me and he saw me just he saw me just take a big fall, and so we 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 continued to ride for a little bit, and on our last run down we we're like okay last run so we 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 went down he's a skier so he took off, and when I got down to the bottom, we're all trying to look for him we're like Where, where's Donnie, and he comes around the corner with his he's holding his arm and he's like. Bro, one of those kids just cut me off, and I think I, I think I uh, sprained my AC joint. And so me and Talano, Talano Fufanga, we're just we're clowning on it. We're like, oh god, that's that's nothing. Like we we sprained our AC joints a bunch of times. He was like, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And so he was like, yeah. He was like, you know, you what what should I do? I was like, well, don't 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 sleep on it. That's for sure. So we're trying to give him advice. He texts us like two days later. He's like, I just went to the doctor. I tore my labrum. I tore this. I was like, okay. I was like, okay, you're legit, bro. I was like, I, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. Just get some rehab or something. So, yikes. Yeah, it, those those little those little kids were up on that on that on those slopes. Sometimes you got to watch out for them. It's just the yeah. little pedestrians you got to watch out for. <laughs> Manti, can't thank you enough for joining us. I I think Jack, when you're done, I could just listen to a podcast of you guys go back and forth and tell stories. <laughs> it, it was great to hear the two of you just interact and, and great to see that relationship on display best of luck with everything we'll see you on campus you when you're in south bend again we'll do. love you uncle jack i'll see you later love you too man great to see you all right jack it's time for our from the irish segment it's presented by tyrac.com we've got a question we always get a question from a couple listeners this is from brady in brookhaven georgia he says what kind of legacy do you hope to leave behind at notre dame um gosh what a great question thank you brady um you know i have been on a campaign for about three years now to try and get people to uh to substitute be irish for go irish um go irish is a cheer which i i want to be part of our athletic event experience but you know, be Irish stands for something else for me, and it is that this place is about values that separate it and about a culture that makes it different. And in everything we do as staff, as student athletes, and I hope as fans, we try and be Irish, mm. we try and reflect those values. I, I got to tell you, decision making here is incredibly easy. Because if you just ask yourself, okay, what advances Notre Dame's values? It sort of answers itself. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, hence my Be Irish campaign. Um, I, I think 
sort of underlying as a practice, it is what people do. Right. The adoption of Be Irish has been a complete failure on my part. I can carry so the torch for I'm you. I'm going to like. keep working on it. Okay. Keep. Uh, uh, we've even made some apparel that says it, and we'll keep working on the Be Irish. So as we wrap up this episode, instead of saying Go Irish, I'll say Be Irish. That would that would be a delight for me. And we'll push for that to be the legacy. Here we are. Final segment of the Wake Up the Echoes Jack Swarbrick Show collaboration. I got to say, before we get into the few topics I want to cover with you, Jack, that conversation with Manti, at least for me, was really eye-opening. I, first of all, when he talked about 2012, I did not go to school here. I've been around long enough to know, you know how important the football program is. I was getting chills hearing him talk about 2012. When you thought about, when you heard him talk about it, did you feel the same way? Because it was, it was kind of amazing to hear really both of you talk about what was going on this campus back then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I know. And to, to hear it through his eyes um, was really cool. Well, I do remember a little bit of the, the overwhelming nature of it that, you know, I don't want to say it was negative, but it wasn't as positive. Manti came to me one day, we were talking, and he said, you know, I hate that I can't just go to the dining hall and eat without people wanting to take a picture yeah. or get an autograph, right? He 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 felt a, a little separation that he hadn't felt before. Yeah, he was bigger than life at that time. The, oh, yeah. The, the wins and the plays and the highs and buzz. I remember, again, on the other side of the country just thinking, who is this guy making all these plays? And it was It was something to watch couple of topics I want to hit just on the athletic landscape to get your final thoughts on before you, you leave this show. I know you're not leaving the athletic department. You're going to be AD emeritus until June. I actually said my goal in life is to be emeritus something at some point. So congratulations. I think it's going to be. It means you're old. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't have that be a goal. I was thinking podcast host emeritus by, by the time we're done here. But NIL. It's a big topic. Everyone's trying to wrap their head around it. Everyone has some kind of opinion on it. As you exit the full-time capacity of being the AD at Notre Dame, what do you see on the horizon? What what concerns you? What excites you? Just just what's your take on where that's all going? No one knows. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have great confidence that we'll find a path forward. College athletics is too important not to. Right. It, it does... Too many good things. You know, consider the amount of young men and women in America that have received their education because of college athletics over the past century. It's, it's, it's amazing. And, and the way it brings communities together. Everything you heard Manti talk about is why college athletics is so important. So we'll find a way forward. You know, we have completely, we as an industry have completely screwed this up. You're not going to be able to put the genie back in the bottle. It's can we get enough structure around it so that we continue to have our student-athletes be students mm -hmm. and we continue to have an environment where a lot of schools can have an opportunity to compete for championships, not just a few. We can protect those two things. We'll be okay. When you look at your time here, six, 16 years, I want to know if there's some part of this job that surprised you, that you look back when you took it, you didn't anticipate either learning that from the job or it just was a part of the job you didn't anticipate spending so much time on. I know we talked about football last time when you said the the piece of advice or the, the note you got from someone was when you took the job, you got to get football right. So you knew that coming in. But what over the last decade and a half did you maybe learn that you didn't anticipate in this role that's going to stick with you going forward? Well, to be clear, I had no idea what I was doing when I took the job, so... <laughs> Uh, everything sort of makes the list. Okay. Um, but the thing that surprised me the most in a very positive way was how much time I spent on university matters, how integrated I was. You know, I mentioned earlier being in the President's Leadership Council, serving on university committees, being involved in meetings to answer questions that had nothing to do with athletics, uh -huh. right? Um that's a really important part of the Notre Dame model, and I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't understand that and was really appreciative of it once I did. Last one I have for you, then, is just about Notre Dame and the impact it's had on your life. You went to school here. 
you've worked in this role. Uh, I think about Notre Dame. I didn't go to school here, but I've worked here now for almost eight years. It's had a tremendous impact on me. I get to do what I think is a pretty neat job. I met my wife here. Uh, it's a special place for someone that didn't go here and didn't work in your capacity. You did those things. What's the impact of Notre Dame on Jack Sorbrick? Yeah. Um, first of all, let me note, um, if, if I'd known you went to Pepperdine, I don't remember it. And having been to that campus a few times, I can't imagine anyone actually studying there. There's yeah. a lot of sightseeing. Yeah. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world, I think. What, what do you, really? You you have to work here? <laughs> um, yeah, it's... Um, it's impossible to quantify. It's about the people, right, and the relationships. And it's those relationships that shape your life. I mean, the, certainly the place is incredibly special, but the people manifest that specialness. And so um, that's, what I'll, that's what I'll take with me. When I was here, it was professors and peers who are still great friends from, from my days in Howard Hall. And this time around, it's my relationship with Father John, with the coaches, um, with so many student athletes like Manti. One of the great things I'll take away from this that, frankly, I never could have imagined is is how much it impacted my whole family. Right. So um, I have been I, I've had the enormous pleasure of spending much more time with my adult children and now my grandchildren, than I ever would have been able to in another job. But they became part of the Notre Dame experience. They wanted to be at the basketball games and at the ACC tournaments. And so seeing my family become part of the experience, most jobs you don't get to do that, mm -hmm. right? And so that that was a unique benefit I never anticipated, and I will be forever thankful for. That's great. I. I also misspoke. I have one final question for you. I just thought of it, but I have to ask. I, I don't think I asked this to you last time, but I ask it to anybody that has gone to Notre Dame that joins us on the show, and that is North or South Dining Hall. Which one are you picking? South. Why South? Uh, it's where I ate for four years. <laughs> My dorm had great proximity to it, Howard Hall. Just walked right across to to the South Dining Hall, but it, it has a... Uh, it has a much more traditional atmosphere, um, I think, of the two. And so, yeah, no, I'm a South Quad, South Dining Hall guy. Okay. Well, tough note to end on. I'm a North guy, so we're going to agree to disagree. Uh, but still, it doesn't change the impact you've had on the university. Well, Just... and it's not a disagreement. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a fair note to end on. <laughs> Jack Swarbrick, as you leave, just know going into Athletic Director Emeritus, you are right. You're always right. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, this has been a pleasure. And I must say, I get asked a lot of legacy questions today, these days, yeah. right? And one of the first things I always cite is fighting Irish media. Mm -hmm. um, it was so important to build the capability that allows us to do this, to talk about Notre Dame, to allow people to see something like our my conversation with Manti and um, I'm so glad we can do this and do it well, and thanks for being part of it. Yeah, thanks for letting me be part of it. It does feel a little full circle. We used to produce the Jack Sorbrick show, so there were some awesome, truly awesome conversations that are still online on that show from back then, and now we're wrapping it up here. So thanks for joining us. Good luck going forward. Thank you. That does it for this week's edition of Wake Up the Echoes, presented by Tyrac.com. Thanks again to Athletic Director Jack Sorbrick for joining us on this show very special edition had a chance to talk to micah shrewsbury also coach rockwell and manti teo thanks to all three of them for joining us this week we're back next week with another edition of wake up the echoes until then tony simioni we'll talk to you next time